Hello everyone, Daryl DeRosia, for those of you who don't know me, I work for Comcast. Um, talking today about uh, understanding capacity limits with your wireless LAN. Clients are your Achilles heel and uh, got some information that hopefully will uh, be useful. A little less technical than the last discussion, but uh, helpful all the same. I don't know about you guys, but I get a lot of questions about how fast can this wireless network go, right? So today we're going to talk about the, the science behind it, the math, a little bit. And there's a lot of physics. It's not rocket scientists to know how fast the network is going to go. Um, you know, I, I got a question from one of our directors at, uh, at work one day, and he said, you know, I need to know how fast this network's going to go for this event that we had. And I gave him a number, whatever it was, and he said, I've got over 100 access points. Cisco says they all do 1.3 gig each. How do I not have 130 gig of throughput? And I looked at him and I said, well, that's pretty simple. The clients are boat anchors, right? You know, it's simple. It's math, right? I did, did a big spreadsheet equation. And uh, he's like, well, how do I explain that up the chain of command to somebody that doesn't understand it, right? When you're looking at wired, it's a lot different. So, but realistically, what throughput can you achieve? So, you know, for understanding the limits of the capacity on, on the network, you know, part of it's the access points, right? What are the access points capable of? Um, we've got, you know, three stream, four stream access points. We've got eight by eight access points. Um, and we've got some, uh, you know, two stream access points. We've still got some old equipment as well. But. Then we need to understand what the capabilities of the clients are. What can the clients actually support? Because that's a big piece of the equation when you're talking about throughput that's going to a client, right? And then the reality of the interactions between them. So I looked at it as uh, this setup here, right? The first thing we need is to know our switch plant can handle the, the throughput that we're going to throw at it. You know, does our core switch support it, right? What about the uplinks from the IDFs to the core? And what about the downlinks to the access points, right? Do we need multi-gig or, or whatever, right? Not going to talk a lot about that because this is the Wireless LAN Professionals Conference, not a switch network. So, and we also need to make sure that we've got internet capabilities that can, can match. We need to know what the number of spatial streams that the access point supports, right? Number of antennas, how, what kind of diversity of paths that we'll get with those spatial streams. And then we need to know what max data rates we can achieve, our phi rates, channel widths, and what channels are supported. Uh, don't think that all channels are usable. There's a lot of clients that have different issues. So I went out to Cisco's website and I took a look at their latest and greatest access points and they, uh, they have a little note here that says 5.2 gigabits per second. Has anybody ever tried to achieve anything like that on these products? Were they able to do it? I, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's possible, but um, you know, that's what's on there, right? So uh, what management sees is, well, my engineer should be able to make this happen. Cisco says, right? They're, they're always right. They wouldn't lie about this. Um, you know, and then they also talk about that it's a theoretical connection rate, um, which People don't read that part, right? It's, you know, of 2.6 gig per radio. So you, know, you can go to their, their website and, and look at the spec sheets, but that's what the marketing department says, because that's theoretically the maximum, right? I mean, Chevrolet has their Corvettes, right? They get, what, about 200 miles an hour? Can anybody do that legally? I don't think so. OK, your Viper may be able to do it. I, not on the open streets. Not that you can talk about. <laughs> so Aruba does something similar. And uh, you know they've got supports up to 1.733 megabits per second. In the, in, and they even talk about how it's achieved, right? Four spatial streams at 80 megahertz wide or two spatial streams at, at 160, right? And then you know what management sees, right? Again, you know we should be able to push this, right? Aruba says they've got a lot of really smart people. Just heard one of them talk, right? He's obviously pretty smart. And their engineers are, are great at, at both companies, right? 
but they use the, uh, the term maximum concurrent data rate. A little different, right? But that, that's what it is. It, it's, a, it's a data rate. And um, the mentality has always been that your connection rate should be your throughput rate, right? But that's not the case. So where do they get the, the numbers from, right? Do they make them up? I don't think so, but what goes into that connection rate, right? Well, the first thing is your modulation rate and coding, right? And that's a function of your signal noise ratio. What signal can you get and encode, or decode rather, uh, and tell apart the different tones, right? So being able to tell um, one tone from another is, is important there. Channel width, right? Well, that's a function of your channel availability, right? How many channels do you have available? Do you only have 20 because you have a lot of APs? Do you have 40? Do you have 80? And then the number of spatial streams. And that's a function of how many transmit and receive chains can operate independently. If you don't have multipath, you have one spatial stream, right? You have to have multiple paths for the access point or the client to be able to tell the two apart, right, the two streams. So if you're in a field, you don't have that. If you're in this building, you probably do. So your location is, is important on that. So here's a little bit more information on the, on the numbers. What does it take to get to those high data rates, right? Well, 30 dB signal to noise ratio or better for MCS9. That's pretty hard to get in a lot of environments, especially high density environments. And you also have to maintain the maximum spatial streams you can, right? Which means you have to have that spatial diversity in order to achieve that. So how achievable is that? I ran a lot of tests. I set up an access point and uh, one client in a relatively clean environment in my house um, this is what I was able to get throughput wise. This is real world over the air. So I took a three stream MacBook Pro with the access point and I was able to get about 776 megabits per second, 80 megahertz wide, which was the limit of that equipment that I had. Um, and this was 90 seconds of testing, so it was over a period of time. If I went down to 40 megahertz wide channels, I was down to about 445. But most people don't have a three stream client, right? So what do they have? Well, they've got a two stream client. So I was able to get about 540 or 240 out of that. And once one stream clients, uh, you know, your limit is right there at about 240, right? That's one client on an access point trying to max it out. I was using Wi-Fi perf to accomplish this. That's not anywhere close to what the marketing numbers are, right? But that's real world over the air. I've cabled up access points in Verwave and other environments to cabled clients, and we can achieve a little bit more than this, but you've got contention, right? And Wi-Fi is all about contention. So if we look at what channels we actually have available here, we've got one, two, Six 80 megahertz wide channels. So we've only got 260s, so it'd be great to have more of those, right? If we're actually going to use them. The uh, 40 megahertz and 20, we've got a lot more to deal with, right? But we've got a lot of DFS and other implications here in in Uni2, right? So trying to use those 80s is sometimes challenging. Uh, or 160, so a little bit more on that to come. So what about our clients, right? That's not how your iPhone looks? I thought that's how they all looked. Oh, what's that? Yes, yeah, I think it is. Now you don't actually see this, right? So we don't have this many uh, antennas on the, on the iPhone, right? So. Clients are designed differently, right? They're optimized for this thing called battery life, 
I don't, I don't know why people want to continue to be able to use their iPhone all the time or other mobile device, right? But they do, and you know, they, they need a longer battery life. So, and they have um, different layouts on the inside, right? So sometimes the antennas are a lot closer together. So sometimes you may have a two-stream client, and you may not actually be able to get spatial diversity from it based on where those, AP, uh, where those antennas are located in the, uh, in the phone or in the device, right? So, and they have different capabilities, right? Different number of spatial streams on each client. Mike's got a great table that has a lot of that information. Their uh, receivers aren't the same as what's in the access point, right? A lot of time it's a consumer grade chipset and um, the quality of that reception of the signal isn't always the same. And I think Keith's numbers that he showed earlier uh, in our testing this week will show, you know, there's a lot of variation between like what an air check shows and what a typical mobile device shows. So, and the smaller the device is, the less likely you are to be able to get uh, spatial streams, right? And you'll get lower quality of signal. So when you're putting your network together, this is kind of what you have, right? You've got different channel widths sometimes, different client capabilities. You've got sometimes you got these old barcode scanners that are G or whatever they are. They're not as capable, right? You've got different requirements all across the board. So Mike's got a great spreadsheet that has a lot of information about what clients support and what they don't support. So I was taking a look at this back into January, and there were four clients total that had three or four spatial streams on there. Uh, one of which, um, I was talking with the person who has the unicorn, the one four stream device, uh, yesterday, and he said it doesn't really work that well. Like he can't get the throughput advertised out of that one device. So, you know, we may have three three stream devices that are that are usable. So, most of the clients are two or one. We've got thirty of the clients that are two spatial streams, right? So, whatever that two stream client can do is kind of your capacity limit, right? You're lowered, you're weakened by what the lowest clients can do. And then the rest of them are are one stream. We've got a few multi-user MIMO clients, but not a whole lot out there today, right? The other thing that's very interesting about the spreadsheet is the channel support. I found it interesting, half of the clients that are advertised five gig support are missing channel 144 altogether, don't support it, or at least they don't advertise support for it. Uh, 24 of them are missing 132 through 144, right? So we've got more channels that aren't available to those clients. We've got 12 clients that are missing from 100 to 144. And we've got nine that are advertising five gig support that only support Uni 1 or Uni 3. Think about that for a minute. That's not a lot of bandwidth, right? So is this what we're left with? Depends on what you're supporting, right? So if you're using these channels and the clients don't support it, they're gonna latch on to an access point that's further away, maybe not the access point that's designed for them or allocated for them. Um, now, it's not all clients. Most of the newest clients support full uh, five gig for the most part, but what is your client mix? I can't tell you what your client mix is because it's your network, right? I can tell you what ours is though. So, but if we're left with nine 20 megahertz wide channels, right, that's not a whole lot to, to work with. 280s, right? Think about that from spectrum reuse standpoint. It's not fun to think about. So, you know, all, everybody's network's different. So, I don't know what you guys see on your networks, right? I, I see a lot of mobile devices. In fact, here's what's using our network. 70% of the devices are mobile. About half and half are iOS versus Android. Then we've got some laptops. We've got Mac OS or OS X. We've got several different windows and about four or five percent are something other than that, right? But this chunk of Android devices 
is all over the place. There's not one predominant uh, Android device that's on our public network. Um, when I look at the individual device types, I see you know 30, or I'm sorry, five percent is about the limit, and that's on the Samsung devices. So it's tough to know what's coming. So taking a look at the uh, the next thing, you know, is what's the what's the phi rates, right? What are those theoretical connection rates uh, actually with the clients, right? So if we're looking at 20 or 40 megahertz wide channels, which is really what we can deploy in most cases, you know, our, our limits are quite a bit different. We're looking at a 400 megabit connection rate, right, in five gig, 40 megahertz wide. That's the limit, right? Well, that's a far cry from 2.6, 5.2 gigabits. It's quite a bit different. So, and then if we have a one stream device, our association rate or connection rate is capped out at 200, right? Again, that's quite a bit different. And that's one, two spatial streams, right? So what's the mix of, of your clients, right? So thinking about that, right, I got to scratch in my head and it's kind of like, wait a second here, there's a huge gap. And then there's the, what actual throughput can you achieve? So Andrew, wherever you are, thank you for your slide here. So looking at it from a, from a switch plant standpoint, we have a consistent link rate, right? The client capabilities are very consistent. There's no such thing as contention and we've got little overhead for ethernet, right? That's not what we have for Wi-Fi. We've got an adaptive link rate. Every packet can go at a different phi rate, different data rate. And that can be a little frustrating at times, a little confusing to especially management or, or leadership or uh, even technical people starting out, right? Getting into this. So, but in our client capabilities are all over the place that we just talked about, right? One stream, two stream. Some of them can support wider channels, some can't. Everything is contention based with Wi-Fi. That's crazy just to think about, right? You have to fight to get your opportunity to talk across the air. And then we've got overhead and it's significant overhead. Uh, so at the end of it, you know, our throughput has nothing to do with the phi rate. It has everything to do with airtime. So how do we measure that, right? Well, airtime utilization is our latency and capacity. So if we take what the application wants to do or what the device wants to do, and we divide that by the device throughput capability, right, we end up getting what airtime is being used, right? So we can start to take a look at it, and I like this view of it, of, you know, we've got Ys and, and Zs, right? And we can start to look at these in airtime. So if that's 10%, that might be 15%. We can stack them on a chart, right? And we can start to see that visually, how much airtime that client is taking up or consuming. So here's a couple examples of that from 802.11 AC, wave one. So if we look at a three spatial stream laptop, we took the uh, different levels of uh, RSSI received, right? Neg 50 is probably as good as we're gonna see on average in a deployment. Medium level, about neg 67 or low is NEG 75, which I think I've seen a lot of people in RFPs that I've read over the years saying, hey, we want NEG 75 everywhere, right? That's our minimum threshold. So that's changed over the years, but that's what's currently out in a lot of locations. And how that's measured is a whole different conversation that, you know, our device sensitivity may not be the same way it's measured. So looking at airtime, tried to send 10 megabits a second from each of these clients at these different signal levels to and from the access point and measured what airtime is consumed by that. 
and Andrew's calculator has some of this as well in there. So to get 10 meg at the best SNR with that three stream laptop, it's 6% of the airtime is consumed. That's the best you can get out of that, right? In those circumstances, three stream. But if you go all the way to the edge, you're consuming 13% of the airtime at that neg 75. So where are your clients when you're designing your network, right? If they're further away from the access point, they're taking more airtime. We did the same thing, and that's a 20 megahertz wide channel, by the way. Did the same thing with the two stream, and that same 10 meg is 10% of the airtime with the two stream client or 19% in the worst case scenario. It gets really scary when we're looking at the one stream devices though, because 59% of the airtime is consumed at neg 75, right? When we're looking at that from an airtime standpoint to get 10 meg across. So if you've got a one stream device that's streaming video, they can consume all of the airtime available, right? So it gets better at 40 megahertz wide channels, right? We can consume 3% of the airtime to 9% with the three stream device. But down here, we're still looking at the smartphone, 9% of the airtime or 37%, right? One stream device. These are real world numbers, I tested them. They match. So during that testing process, I did this. I had uh, actually had a few more screens up, but had Cisco Spectrum Expert, I had MetaGeek, uh, and I had Spectrum XT. I also had uh, OmniPeak running so that I could look at different views of it, right? The Spe Spectrum XT, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Cisco Spectrum Expert, I like the airtime utilization view of that the best. So this one here is the one phone. It's running 20 megahertz wide. And this is at the best SNR, and we're right around that 19% that utilization there. I know it's hard to, hard to see here. But that's tested, right? It, it, it's real. And I found out that during that process that MetaGeek, what they call utilization, is slightly different than what I intuitively thought it was. So when you're looking at your tools, you need to understand what they call different things um, and know how to read the, the measurements. So during this same time that we saw this, I actually was grabbing a packet capture to get the average phi rate coming across. Average was 21. That's how much the overhead, the management frames, bring down that average connection rate. So I did the same thing, running 40 megahertz wide, and it's right around 9% there. And you can see wider channel, that was good, right? And you can see all the, the spectrum changes. And here's, again, the uh, average fire rate was 66 running across there. So that fire rate, you know, that theoretical connection rate and reality don't always match, especially when you're interacting with clients, right? So, I tried to put this into a format that was kind of more typical, and I think Keith will have the slides at the end of this. You're welcome to cannibalize the, the presentation view here. This is the way I like to, to look at it. So taking this, you know, on an average, that middle number, right, 8%, um, you know, to kind of average that out to 8% for the tablet, instead of 10 meg, you're getting 6.5. That's quite a bit different, right? Same airtime used. Or you can get three meg through the one stream device. Same airtime. All things are equal here from an airtime standpoint. The throughput varies quite a bit. So if we take the same thing and we load up an access point, let's just load it up as high as we can go. We can achieve about 75 to 80% airtime, right? We're dealing with contention, right? And we've got overhead. So same time slices, um, we got three meg each, 
we can get 34 laptops on and we can run about 100 meg through that access point. That is not 2.5 or 1.7, last time I checked. Um, and that access point is, is full. Again, this is 20 megahertz wide, right? Management has different expectations sometimes. Same thing with two stream devices, and we're looking at 65 megabits per second. With the smartphones, we can get about 10 of those on and we can run 30. Same exercise, same setup, again, medium SNR, and we're 40 megahertz wide here. We can get 200 megabits per second. Again, we've loaded up that access point to about 80% utilization. This is best case scenario because there's no interference here. This is, you know, limited other devices on this channel. As you can see from the spectrum earlier, I didn't have anything else contending for the channel. 130 on the, on the tablets, we could get 20 of those, or uh, 45 for the smartphones. This scares me to think about these numbers because you know, the expectations of a lot of people that don't understand this is that you're gonna get the, the marketing numbers out of there. So, does anybody have a network that's just all three stream devices, two stream devices, or one stream? I don't ever see this in reality, so I started doing some mixing and matching, right? So the first example here, and uh, we've got 15 laptops, four tablets, one smartphone, 88 megabits per second. They're all trying to get different bandwidths here, but they're taking up the same amount of airtime. Next example, seven laptops, eight tablets, eight smartphones, right? We can get 67 meg out of that, roughly. And down here, more of your high density environments are all mobile devices for the most part, right? Looking around here, I see a lot of tablets and I still see laptops, but you know, this isn't a high density, like a stadium. So you're looking at you know, 41 meg out of that access point. Same thing, 40 megahertz wide. We can get up to about 176 with 30 laptops, 10 tablets, two smartphones. It's a little different, right? Looking at it this way. The, uh, going down here, 17, 17, 17, 136. I don't know who has that environment, maybe a school. And down here, you're gonna have more of your public networks. So looking at your clients and how they interact with that density, right? If you can group all your clients where they're perfectly separated here, right? You can start to look at a few things, but understanding the client mix, the signal reception or quality that they're getting, understanding the bandwidth the devices are using. I think Lee's gonna talk about all the requirements tomorrow if I remember right. So understanding what those requirements are helps you shape up your design and helps you prevent overloading access points and getting the right number of access points there. Too many or too few can, can create problems, right? So by getting the density right and getting the right number of clients to an access point, you can reduce your interference some, right? You can reduce the amount of airtime required, right? That's a big one, especially if we're looking at that neg 75 threshold of airtime. And that'll help you reduce the, uh, the uh, contention, right? And you can acquire the medium to use the airtime. You can transmit, reduce your latency. And you can increase the airtime and capacity available for each client. So when you're looking at, at creating your design, right? Coverage is the first thing you've got to look at because if you don't have coverage, you don't even have Wi-Fi, right? You don't even have anything if you don't have coverage. You've gotta make sure that you have a high quality signal to your clients where you can. 
And then your transmit, transient areas where people are just roaming through, maybe coverage is all you need. Density. You've got to make sure that you've got the right number of access points and infrastructure for your clients, right? If you're looking at lecture hall, auditorium, this room, right? I think it's more than two access points I'd put in here, especially for this conference. But uh, you've got to get that right. You've got to match that up. Understanding what devices are going to use your network, right? Is it all one stream devices, two stream devices? Are there any eight stream devices out there? I haven't seen any. I think Mike called the one four stream device a unicorn when we were talking about it on Twitter. It's, they don't make them, right? They're, they're hard to find. So understanding what your client demand is. So what applications are they gonna be using? Are they gonna be streaming video the whole time? Is it gonna be streaming audio? Is it just typical browsing and background traffic? And then you wanna get optimal performance out of your network, right? You wanna have the highest MCS rates possible where you can, highest SNR. So if you look at your access point and from a coverage standpoint, you know, you want to keep them at your, at your highest signal quality you can, right? Achieve higher data rates, less air time, and you get more capacity, right? As, as you go out of this circle, this primary circle, you end up MCS4, MCS5, or worst case, MCS1 or zero. And that you're really getting slow at that point, right? And hopefully you have a better access point for those guys. Because they're consuming a lot of airtime and a lot of, of your allocated resources. So I think everybody here is probably familiar with channel contention, so not gonna go into it in a great deal. But in order to get reuse, in order to reuse channel you know, uh, 40, right? You have to have frequency separation or spatial stream separation, right? So those are the only two ways to get more air time, or more, more time, or more, I'm sorry, more throughput at the same time. And a lot of times, you know, you won't have, you won't have frequency separation. So Andrew Von Nagy had, uh, I was hoping was gonna be able to present with me today, is not. And uh, he was able to provide a, an example at an EDU environment. So looking at this environment, right, this is kind of a real world scenario. We've got coverage for five gig only for the students in these classrooms. And that's both ENA's recommendation and Apple. We've got 30 devices per classroom, about 30 kids, right, maybe a teacher. And we've got the iPad Air 2s, they're all five gig capable, 40 megahertz. So realistic data rate, 270. So what's that on a throughput standpoint? About 135 megabits per second. So looking at that, we've got a little calculation here. Four meg per tablet is what our, uh, our demand is in order to get a video across that's at 720p. So the device throughput divided by the application bandwidth, so what the device wants to consume, you end up with the number of devices per AP that's optimal for that environment. And this is also assuming that you have your, uh, your, your signal quality there, right? So if we take that 135, we divide it by that four megabits per second, we can load up those access points to about 33 of those iPads before we're out of capacity. So we put those down here on five gig, it takes up about 80% of the airtime. That's it, that's what you've got. I hope you don't have another classroom that's contending for airtime on that channel at the same time. And leaves 2.4 over here open for whatever junk or garbage is coming on the network because we all know the students don't just have their one iPad, right? Anybody from an EDU that has a lot of students in there, they probably all have their phones in their pocket and everything else, maybe a laptop. So throw those on 2.4. So what does that look like from a design standpoint, right? So we take these access points in the hallway, and if we've got 
30 tablets here in each of these rooms, right? Have we exceeded the initial 33 number? We have, right? So this won't work from a throughput standpoint or an airtime because this requires 60 tablets per room. That's 240 megabits per second. That's greater than 135 last time I checked. Not the best at math, but we have an airtime bottleneck there, right? So this will not work from a requirement standpoint. It may work from a coverage standpoint. It may work just fine. So if we don't have sufficient throughput, we've got to do something else, right? So in this particular scenario, you can move one AP to each classroom. Now, that's for the requirements, right? So if you're looking at it, you know, if all the four of these classrooms are online at the same time, you need that. And now your required cap capacity is 120 megabits per second. You've got 135, you're in good shape. You've got sufficient airtime to meet those requirements. So taking the same formula and logic into a high density environment or stadium arena, right? A little bit different, but everything is the same building blocks, right? So we take a look and we've got 25% of the clients are going to be two stream capable. It's typically what I see. Um, I look forward to seeing the stats on the, the Super Bowl and what the breakdown was two stream versus one stream versus three stream there. So, but in the, uh, in the fan facing areas, they can't usually bring in a MacBook Pro. So they end up with two stream or one stream devices. So assuming that they're able to get their, uh, their maximum throughputs or fire rates rather, this is kind of where you end up. So, you know, we have a total of about 120 devices in a given seating area, and 20% of those will connect at any time concurrently. So if our 500 kilobits per second per user, we can get about 30 meg out of this one access point. That's 75% of the airtime. So without spectral reuse, 30 megabits per second. So in my particular case, that's what I had to tell my management team. We're gonna get about 30 megabits per channel available. And then we had to factor in reuse. So I took this and blew it out. And we said, well, we've got 24 channels available in five gig that are non-overlapping. In a, in a theoretical environment, that'll cover about 7,000 seats and we can connect about 1,400 devices concurrently to achieve this. Unfortunately, a lot of stadiums, you end up with a lot more seats than that. So this is best case. This is assuming that you don't have things contending with you from outside. Anybody who's ever been in a stadium knows that people bring in their MiFi's. Uh, sometimes you have press or media that brings things in that you might not want there. Uh, coach communication systems, things like that, that are, that are taking up airtime. So this is best case without any reuse. Now you can document reuse and you can keep adding on to this, right? If you can show that you're going to get reuse, you may or may not. So how do you get more with less? And the, the fact of the matter is, is if I can reduce the amount of airtime that that client takes, I'm not, I'm, I'm gaining efficiencies, right? So two access points on the same channel, I hear a lot of times that that's bad, don't do it. But if I can achieve an airtime efficiency, if I can achieve that gain, that 39% gain for that one stream device, I think that outweighs, in most cases, the hit from having that access point, those two access points on the same channel. You have beaconing, yeah, you've got clients, yeah, contention. But if I can get 39% of that airtime back or not lose it, I'm in much better shape, right? Just by getting better coverage, better signal to that client and getting better SNR and then MCS rate, right? So, and this is a 10 meg situation or uh, in the chart. 
So, conclusions here, right? So, I mean, without understanding your client mix or what devices are connecting to your network, those awesome marketing numbers that every access point manufacturer gives you are meaningless. I'd love to believe them. I'd love to be able to achieve those numbers. Unfortunately, the devices don't support it. Or real world physics don't support it. We've got one or two, arguably, 160 megahertz wide channels. I'd love to have 100 of those. I don't see it happening ever, but it would be nice. So understanding what that client device is, right, that makes a huge difference. And you can start to calculate out things like airtime efficiency. So, you know, where are the uh, desired clients going to be? What are SNRs going to be, right, to a typical client? And what fire rates that a client's going to achieve? And then what network capability do we have, right? Because if we don't have an access point that's more than two streams or three streams, we can't support three stream client fire rates, right? And Andrew's got a great calculator. If you aren't using it already, it can help you with a lot of this math. I did it all manually. I went to his calculator and punched in the same things and was able to achieve the same results. I also did real world actual throughput testing in my lab. So it's a great tool. And then that four stream access point would be awesome. And I would deploy them everywhere if I had clients that match that capability. I'm, again, we've got one, Jake has it over there, it's a unicorn. Um, and it, you know, are there other reasons to deploy that four stream access point? Yes, absolutely. But it's not gonna get you those throughput numbers. So looking forward, what do we, what do we have, right? Well, most of the devices that are coming out now are two stream. Our iPhone 6 and 7 are all two streams. Uh, they achieve two streams most of the time in my testing when I look at packet captures. Uh, not all of the time. Uh, same thing with Samsung. They are two stream, they've been two stream for a little longer. Uh, the Note 7 was multi-user MIMO. Um, if you had one before it caught fire, um, you might have been able to take advantage of that, but there's not a whole lot of those available. The multi-user MIMO capable phones, right, or devices. So you've got to understand, hopefully it's going that way, hopefully we'll see more, because I'd love to see more utilization out of that. So overall bandwidth capabilities will uh, increase, right, as our clients go to two streams, right? So, you know, my example, I use 2575, uh, and we'll start to see that slide over uh, to more two stream. Eventually, hopefully, we'll get to 50-50, right? Or, or maybe even better. Um, depending on your environment, you may have spatial diversity and be able to use those. So, but as you start to see those new devices, the bandwidth consumption of the devices also tends to go up. So what's your net gain? It's very minimal. Multi-user MIMO, I, I, again, I love it, right? So as our adoption grows, you know, maybe we'll get some gains. Uh, the current estimates are 50 to 100% gains. I think uh, we had some better gains uh, advertised potentially with AX. Um, we'll see what those come into play. But in AC, those gains are one direction, only downstream from the access point. So while you get some gains in one direction, you don't have those gains on your upstream traffic. So you need to understand what your, uh, what your clients are doing, right? Is it all upstream traffic or downstream traffic? If it's video going to the devices, it's all downstream, right? Except for the acknowledgements. So that makes a difference in when you're designing your network. And the FCC, right? So hopefully we'll get more channels, right? Uh, but we've got to make sure that the clients and, and the hardware actually supports them. So anything over 40 megahertz wide unless you're in an isolated environment, it's really hard to get any spatial reuse out of, right? Or frequency reuse, sorry. Um, love to talk about that more if you guys are finding any ways to achieve it. So, and should new channels become available, right, it takes a while for the hardware to support it. So we've got channel 165, that's like this little orphan channel over there. Uh, 144 was missing from uh, about half of the clients, right? So 
you know, some of these phones and, and devices don't support all the channels today. So if the FCC tomorrow says, hey, we're gonna open up as much spectrum as you guys need, um, we won't be able to use it for until hardware is refreshed, right? With phones, typically every, what, two, three years, people are refreshing their phones, but uh, a lot of devices in the enterprise, that refresh cycle isn't the same. So that's all I've got for today. Any questions? Scott, can you get the throw box up? So, any questions for Daryl? Not even one? We had to have a reason to throw this box around anyway. <laughs> yes, sir. Hold on. Wait, wait. Box is coming. Okay, where is it? Turn around. Raise your hand. White shirt. Okay, get ready. Uh oh. <laughs> I guess I can't. Play talk, talk into the black part. What's that? Talk into the black part. Oh, it's a microphone. Hello, can you hear me? Right there. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Love the black part. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Hello. My question uh, goes right to your channel uh, reuse, uh, frequency reuse, and it is, uh, what would you guesstimate uh, since, say, 2010, 2011, what percentage of clients actually support transmit power control 8H11H? I don't have an answer for that. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of the, the clients powering down when, uh, when I'm looking at it um, in my environments. Uh, but I'm not, the way I'm capturing that, for the most part, I'm looking at you know, Spectrum XT logs or, or frequency power outputs, and then just the, uh, I'm not getting packet captures from the access points, I'm doing over the air. So it's tough for me to tell that. Uh, somebody who does captures over their hardware, over their infrastructure, would probably have a better uh, perspective on that than what I do. Thank you. Mike, other, did you have something? Another question? Buddy. Mike up front. <laughs> Thanks. Um, traffic patterns or frame sizes when you were doing your throughput testing? Yes. You mentioned Wi-Fi perf. Were you specifying frame sizes or was it, was it all Wi-Fi perf? It was all Wi-Fi perf on the examples that I shared. Uh, that was the only thing going across there. I had, um, uh, yep, I've got a, uh, in my office, I've got a rack with my access points, and on the other side, I had my, my phones and laptops set up. And I was going about, I don't know, 15 feet across the room, and, um, you know, it was just in that room, the, the pass. So I would just, I'd have my server uh, hardwired in, so I had my MacBook Air connected gigabit to the, uh, to the LAN controller, mm -hmm. and then it would go directly to the access point. So default settings on the Wi-Fi perf? Yes, yes, yeah. which TCP. I think is uh, 1450. Uh, TCP or UDP? Thanks. TCP or UDP? UDP is what I was throwing across there. Okay, one more question. Up front. Sorry. Oh, oh. Uh, <clears throat> to go back to your throughput testing, uh, what AP did you use, and did you try with different APs and, and find that you get the same results? Or? I would have loved to have tested different access points. Um, I was limited to what I had at my house at the time. I was using an enterprise class AP. I was using the Cisco 3700. Okay. I contacted Aruba. I was asking for some uh, equipment so that I could do competitive or comparative, um, and I did not get it in time before this presentation to actually compare. Okay. Uh, it wouldn't be hard to set up, and if Aruba wants to give me the equipment, I'm happy to do the test, same apples to apples, and share it with Keith for distribution. You, you might be lucky and win one of the ones we have here for you. So, thank you very much. <laughs>